So we're going to start here with, despite having two weeks worth of news to catch up on, we have only two new anime announcements. So let's get right to, to those. The Comic Festa anime website announced this week that Tamami Katsura's Adults Are Clueless About Falling in Love manga is getting a television anime adaptation. The adult romantic comedy is set to debut on Tokyo MX in October. As typical for Comic Festa anime series, the show will have both the normal on-air edition as well as the more explicit premium edition uh, streaming on the Comic Festa website. The story focuses on two business work workers in their 30s who both haven't been in a relationship in many years. The two meet at a matchmaking party and initially get off to a bad start, but a provocative comment from the lady, quote, takes things in an unexpected direction, end quote. The direction may be unexpected for the characters. I'm pretty sure we can all guess what that direction is. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the manga was first serialized digitally under a different name and is published in print under the current title. The third compiled volume is scheduled to be released in October. So this is kind of a fun one because I'm just kind of curious about, you know, what the, um, you know, with these kinds of, like, do you guys look forward to these? Like, is, is this kind of format, this kind of story, something that you're interested in checking out? You mean the I, premium edition one or the, or the regular one? Either or both. You which, know, which, I don't judge. I, I've, I've been a sucker for these these kind of story, uh, stories all my life. Uh, it, it really doesn't matter what context it is um, when it comes to uh, not just rom-coms, but just romance in general. I'm just, I'm... Go ahead, take my money. I'll, I'll... You're, you're hopeless <laughs> romantic, Steve. I, 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 I like it. Like but... Was what it was it last season was uh, Wodakoi, uh, the one where it was a bunch of o adult otaku's working in an office setting, and they all start sort of hooking up together. Okay, could be. I don't remember it, but yeah, it sounds it was like Wotaku or something mm -hmm. like that. But it was yeah. it was something where you have adult otakus who they haven't ever dated like anybody else in the world and they're all working in an office and they sort of run into each other and then they pair off and start dating mm -hmm. i was like okay that's this sounds lacking the otaku part of it but it just sounds very similar it's like okay <laughs> again this, you know the, the poor japanese people who who no wonder why the declining birth rate if they're in their 30s and they haven't dated <laughs> anybody in years <laughs> or you know you, you, you're starting a little late in the game here, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta catch up soon. I like the cover art that his hand looks like a giant claw-like monster <laughs> thing. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what is up with that cover art. Like, wow. <laughs> you play basketball with those hands? Or, you, or do you just rend flesh from human bones? <laughs> like, I, I would crap. love that twist. That, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he just happens to be a horrible monster who plays basketball. Yeah. Wait a minute. And it's Space about. Jam? You know? yeah. <laughs> confused space monster who plays basketball and rends flesh looking for love in a modern world hey it worked oh. for twilight you know it can yeah. work here why, why not exactly. um all right moving on to the other anime announcement of this week music composition cycle circle honeyworks announced on friday that it's lip lip virtual idol unit is inspiring an anime film the film will be titled how to enjoy this world secret story film and will mark Honeyworks' 10th anniversary. The story of the film will cover how the members of the idol duo met and how they came to, for to form their group together. Uh, Fumia Muroi, animation director for Black Lagoon, is directing the anime at Clap, with Yoshimi Narita of Pretty Cure writing the script. The virtual unit de debuted back in 2016 and have contributed insert songs to several anime over the years, as well as releasing independent originals. I don't know, this just sounds like a you know fun feel good story about sure we'll do a little anime film about these these characters why not Meh. And, <laughs> eh. and again i'll buy into it but sure. you know i'll, that, I'll that, wait for that, one that, of the two of you to do a review and then then maybe i'll buy into it <laughs> have either of you seen I, pretty cure no yeah i have not either uh, but i've heard good th I, i've heard it's one of those things where it's like you know you may not get into it but if you check it out, you'll probably enjoy, you know, whatever episodes you watch. So, just curious. Now, it, I, I'm feeling that that will be my 4 a.m. anime. 
Mm-hmm. I'm sitting there and going, oh, God, I can't sleep. Okay, wh- whatever the next one is, <laughs> click. There we go. I need something like the like the SAO Neuralizer helmet thing so I can watch <laughs> anime while I sleep. There's not enough time in the waking day to watch everything. This is the problem. This is definitely the problem. Um, well, it's going to be a little easier for you to catch stuff soon because uh, an announcement next up that won't surprise anyone, I suspect – Tokyo Comic Con has announced its move to an online format this year. The event will be held December 4th through 6th, so we have a little while to wait. And it will feature live streaming from Chiba's Makuhari Messe Event Hall, where the physical event was set to take place. Events to be streamed include stage presentations, a celebrity area, a cosplay area, an artist alley, an exhibition area, and an EC area. I don't know what that means. Uh, All these events will be streamed for free on the Tokyo Comic Con World website. Uh, viewers will also have the option to pay 500 yen for premium content. Uh, now, this is only the fifth overall year for the Tokyo Comic Con event. This intrigues me. Having a free online convention where you pay for premium content. That's kind of an interesting idea. Well, after the experience with, with FunCon, mm-hmm. you... you I'll I I will be very curious to hear about how people are are managing this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Because I, like I told you guys, you know, the Funimation Con, it's difficult to moderate questions coming in from participants yeah. when you've got um, stuff going on. You're you know you kind of have a preset program for your people that are happening, and then mm-hmm. you have to get somebody to moderate what's going on. Mm-hmm. And then when you've got content that's you know canned content from Japan, mm-hmm. it's you can't. There's not really any kind of rea- inter- interaction with it. Yeah. It just is what it is. And it's like, it's, you could tell that pieces of this are, are really there. It's really functional. Brent OnCon did it far, far better than FunCon did. Mm. You know what I mean? But, like the interactivity yeah. with people and the programming, everything went much better. So I'm, I'll be curious to see whether now they're sort of getting the hang of this mm-hmm. and they're going to be able to sort of <clears throat> get it functional and more fun and interactive. This is the weird thing. Events to be stream to be streamed include a cosplay area, include yeah, is... an artist alley. How do you stream an artist alley? It's gonna have to be f- like bits and pieces fed from individual contributors. I mean, I'd, yeah. if you don't have the actual yeah. con, you're sure as hell not gonna have a room full of artists that you're gonna be like, here's a picture, look at the yeah, artist. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, cosplay, that's, I'd be curious, you know, is that you have to submit, have to, you can submit five still pictures or mm. 15 seconds right. of video of you and your cosplay, and then that will just clip through that. It's described as a cosplay area. Maybe that's, maybe I'm that's so this. Curious about. Yeah. But why couldn't that physically be cosplay area is tab C? Uh, that's true. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. that was that was what FunCon did. They had all these different mm-hmm. tabs, and then there were different like Byzantine kind of ways to get through the <laughs> myriad of stuff to find content. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you know that was a tabs kind of an area. True. So. Yeah. Or it could actually be that they're actually going to social distance and yeah. do whatever to bring people in just to do the cosplay. Yeah. And maybe these are things these are things where people have timed entries. I mean, you, they come to the Comic Con, oh. yeah, you know, and you go, Okay, here you are and you have your ten minutes or like you know, you were saying the, the clips, you know, mm-hmm. do a clip, okay, here's your time limit to do to show up, put together your thing, take pictures. Walk your little walk on the catwalk. You could totally, on the catwalk. Right. You could totally do a cosplay contest, social distanced. Right. And yeah. Now for the for the artist alley, I I I don't. Huh. Um, and, and I mean, I, you could yeah. totally set up a booth. Right. You could have right. booths set up in an alley. Right. But there's. <laughs> but I, I guess it, you could social distance and just have people coming in and. Or would it? Or would it be like the the Gundam thing? I don't know if you guys visited mm-hmm. the Gundam going on this week whereas in one of the rooms you actually have the 360 and you go and you click on and click on a room and does a 360 so you can move the cursor around and see the whole room room and see the whole room zoom in zoom out Mm -hmm. things like that so maybe that could be it but then again 
but then again, if it's the artist alley and someone's selling stuff, you know, where's the how's how are they going to do that? Yeah. I'm sure there's yeah. a they'll be able to like a you know like they do for the regular uh, dealers room, but yeah. you know, but uh, you know one yeah, but things- is that is that kind of weird though? If you yeah. if you actually had a a specific place for the cosplay, a specific place for the artists, and yet you're saying it's an online con, you're like, uh, uh it's, yeah, it's not. The only thing you're See, doing that, is not letting the public in, <laughs> like, right? So, but, you know, but that's the thing. I think that the, the the larger cons are having the problem that they're having, particularly with you know with what happened with Otakon, I think, is and the reason why Oncon did did well is because I think they are trying to do these big ticket items like the cosplay like that, instead of like kind of going more along the lines of. Doing like a panel or showing something or doing a presentation yeah. as opposed to having, you know, I mean, you know, like you're saying the canned interview. Well, you're not really asking a question, so it doesn't really do anything for you. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of fun to watch, but you can watch that anywhere at any time. Mm-hmm. They just have to upload it to YouTube. That's all they have to do. Right. Whereas, you know, you give someone, say, you just do a list of, um, you know, like panels and then maybe somewhere if you're able to show some anime. You can really keep it really simple, and people enjoy that. It, particularly if you have the most important part of it, which is the interactivity, which I still don't see on this. Mm-hmm. So I'm, on the on the con itself. So I'm doing a little googling on Tokyo Comic Con to give you an idea. Last year, uh, guests included Jude Law, Orlando Bloom, and Rupert Grint. Really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Um, and apparently they've got some deep pockets in there. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and a uh, guy named Chris Hemsworth, who I think has done some movies somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Who's he? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Who that guy. It's relatively <laughs> obscure, but I'm sure he's. <laughs> I'm sure he's an up and coming. Right. So I wonder if that's also part Thank of it. Is that, you know, if you have major guests coming that you are probably paying for, it's like you no, know, no. Yeah. We will have a stage, and they will be on that stage. You know. Yeah, you've already committed the the money and the contract to get it all organized, so it's yeah. got to happen somehow. Yep, yep. Mm. Um, interesting stuff. Um, moving right along, our news this week brings another update from Crunchyroll, this time one that might affect some of us uh, more than others. The streaming service announced this week is preparing to implement new tiers of service. Uh, instead of the current two tiers, for and premium, there will now be three tiers in most of the world and four in the United States. The free tier will remain as it's always been, or as it's been for a while, uh, with ads during the streaming and simulcast episodes available a week after debut. The first paid tier will now be called the Fan Tier, and will work similarly to the current premium subscription. It'll cost 8 bucks a month, or the equivalent in other countries, and have no ads with simulcast shows available as soon as they air. The mega fan tier, mega fan, will will cost uh, ten bucks a month, and includes all the features from the regular fan tier plus two new features: offline viewing, and concurrent streaming. The mega fan tier will allow users to access up to four streams at once, so you can have you know four different devices running simultaneously, playing anime, different anime presumably, all off those different devices, all off one account. So family plan, basically. Um, the, yeah, exactly. Uh, U.S. subscribers of this tier will also receive a $15 discount on a purchase of 100 bucks or more from the Crunchyroll store once every three months. So, buy your merch. Additionally, subscribers in the United States will have a fourth premium tier option, the Ultimate Fan Tier. Um, this tier gets access to up to six streams at once as well as all the perks from the premium tiers, and a $25 off a $100 purchase every three months, plus a swag bag and access to exclusive member-only merchandise. Ooh. Yes. The ultimate... Yes. It's because you're an ultimate fan. Um, Fans in the UK and other English-speaking regions won't get the Crunchyroll store discount. And instead of the ultimate fan tier, we'll have the option of the annual mega fan tier instead, which gives a 16% discount if you sign up for a full year all at once. The new tiers are set to be implemented worldwide in early September. Um, so I got to admit, you know, this is not a particularly, you know, stunning um, 
uh, bit of news here. But, you know, that's fine, I think. Um, Where do they come up with 16% discount no, for, that for is weird. foreign, that is foreign customers? Weird. Like, 15 or 20? You pick 16. 16. Roll like, the 20-sided die. I mean, it's like, I've, I've, seen dis- I've seen discounts at places where, you know, hey, it's our 10th anniversary. You get 10% off. Hey, it's our 15th, 15. Or hey, it's our 22nd. You get 22%. You know, it's kind of the gimmick. Right. Mm-hmm. Crunchyroll wasn't around and, you know, <laughs> new in 2016. It's been around for like, what, 2007? Was that 16 years ago? No. No, no. No, 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 no. No, no, no. no. But I mean, that's, that's what I'm kind of wondering. I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know the significance of 16. Yeah. Um, let me just uh, check real quick, see if there's any. Uh... Um, anything on the the item? I'm not sure, honestly. Um, oops, one second. I mean, unless it's some kind of weird, like UK, Europe, you have the VAT, right? So un- unless mm-hmm. it's some, it's keyed in somehow to how VAT locks into mm-hmm. store purchases, and and that makes it effectively a 10 percent discount because there's a six percent VAT. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's... I don't know. Only thing I can expect. Um, yeah, sixteen percent discount on uh, on that. Let me just see if there is a a thing um, free ultimate fan. Um, nope, they don't say anywhere that I can see. Hmm. But I, I think you're right. It sounds like a, a that thing going. Yeah, on. they must be trading something off. Mm-hmm. I just it, it's very interesting that they're getting the 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 same sort of Netflix utility. Like you get. You know, four right. Netflix accounts where you can watch stuff mm-hmm. concurrently, and it's like that. So it's interesting that they're introducing this, but you know, I'm still a little salty from when they dropped 77 shows, mm-hmm. of which like nine of them were I was watching parts of. You know what I mean? It's like that's great. You're trying to Netflix yeah. this, but how are you leveraging your your cachet to get me more of the things that have now gone away? <laughs> You know what I mean? I, I, Funimation seems to be steaming right along with all the stuff you used to have. Mm. <laughs> like, well, and I like of God of I like God of High School, and that's completely their property. I'm mm-hmm. cool with that. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I wanted to watch the rest of Squid Girl. Mm. I, I was only like three episodes <laughs> into it. Well, what, what I find most interesting about this is this idea that um, apparently a lot of people want to watch there. There are enough families where multiple people all watch anime where this is it's kind of a crazy thing. thing yeah That's or kind of- there's a there's a lot of lonely nerds who have lonely nerd friends mm. and <laughs> they're all borrowing each other's accounts yeah. just like netflix <laughs> Well, that's the interesting thing is, I think... And I, I mean that only jokingly. Lonely Nerd, that's totally a joke. Don't anybody take offense, <laughs> please. It's just using this for comedy purposes. Totally. S- sense um, of humor. Yeah. Uh, but no, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting point is that um, if you're... I, I wonder how much this is designed to combat that, to say people who are sharing Crunchyroll accounts. Because it's annoying because then, you know, oh, I want to watch this, but you're watching it and so it's blocking me right. or whatever. Uh, if I pay an extra just two bucks a month, well, then that's not a problem anymore. Um, yeah, I can see that being a, a significant thing. And I can also see, you know, being at a con and somebody saying, oh, I, you know, I've, I've heard about this thing. It's really cool. I want to watch it. And me saying, here, you know, I, I have a spare, you know, view, a viewership thing. You know, yeah. let me let me let me give you your information for a month. I'll, I'll share this with you and uh, we can we can make it all work that way. Um, well, I haven't because- checked in lately, but. Crunchyroll used to have a thing where you could forward, you got a pass every month mm. for a three day free trial. Mm. And I know some of the people I work with where I was talking about a series I was watching and, mm. you know, their entry into anime was still fairly shallow. And I was like, you know what? Let me forward you my three day free pass. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you watch what you know, whatever you want, but watch this series. If you like that, then you're gonna like. Mm-hmm. You probably might like this, mm-hmm. and then they end up getting a subscription. So yep. it, it's it's interesting that you know. I wonder if they cut that out because mm-hmm. I have not seen a notice about getting a free pass lately. That's a good point. I haven't either. I know this. I well, last I checked, they had a 14 day free trial. Right. So that may now sort of you know take over. Run away. Yeah. Know. 
Well, I was going to say, because I used to get that every month, and I had like 30 of them in my inbox that was like, oh, you know, he has a premium mender. Here's your three day free pass to give out to friends. And it's like, mm-hmm. I just ended up accumulating them all, and then I just stopped getting those notices. Mm-hmm. Like, oh. Totally. Um, d- does the notice of exclusive merchandise not just the swag bag um but which yeah swag bag is gonna be not no offense that's probably gonna be worth what you're gonna pay for it no. um but access to exclusive merch does that do, do your ears perk up at all at that not really not really i, I you know if you if you said it, merch never gets me into buying things like, mm-hmm. or you know like a buying a service or going to a you know, hey, if you subscribe early to this, then you get this this wonderful T-shirt, whatever. I don't you have a tote really bag. Nice things, right? Yeah, those are nice things. But you know, I got a, a closet over here full of just detritus from cons, and I've got a, like a freaking plastic fan from 2004 Otacon in there. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's it's like it, it, you know, no. The the answer is really no, unless it's something that you know obviously some type of big promotion with it where you're mm-hmm. really giving something significant mm-hmm. or it's a discount on the service itself. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I know, you know. Um, Crunchyroll has been doing a lot of stuff with Benny Gold mm. they, or they, they did a lot of stuff with Benny Gold. So they had a lot of Crunchyroll by Benny Gold and it had Crunchy Hime on the t-shirt. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've been doing a ton of stuff with Junji Ito lately. Mm-hmm. So there's the Crunchy exclusive Junji Ito stuff. And it's like, uh, mm? yeah. I mean, it's their yeah. their T-shirts. Typically, um, there's not really like just simple stuff. Like I bought initially when Crunchyroll launched as a legal streaming service. <laughs> I bought a Crunchyroll T-shirt. It just said Crunchyroll. Mm-hmm. Your cure, your cure for the anime fever. Mm-hmm. They never have had another T-shirt like that. It's always Junji Ito by Crunchyroll, Benny Gold by Crunchyroll. Mm-hmm. It's like none of it's never. There's no merch that's just simple them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah, what, what exactly are to... what what are you exactly doing that's super special to make it exclusive merch? Because because you got a what? point. Because there is something to say. Like if you are a fan of of mm-hmm. Crunchyroll, if you, if you are the fan of the service, like if you like a big Otakon fan like myself. You know, then I then that would speak to me, but that's a specialized, very niche. Right. Trip. You know, like, you know, when I go to Otakon, I'm always buying something because I know that that money is going to support something that I like. Mm. So that's, you know, I have a ton of Nalgene bottles with Otakon on it and, mm. you know, you know, shot glasses and, you know, <laughs> you know, so many shot glasses. Mm. I don't even have enough booze for the shot glasses. Your $1 purchase makes you a hero for anime. Right. There we go. As we all right. know. <laughs> you supported the industry with that your dollar. Mean... It went all right. the way. Right. Right. Um, but no, Which you... joking, joking aside, a dollar if you have 200 million people? Sure. Right. Mm. <laughs> That's um... money. So. But no, I think it's, it's one of the things is that, you know, gee, where could I find a T-shirt? Mm-hmm. If I wanted a T-shirt. Etsy? <laughs> eBay? There yeah, are, right. Amazon? You're not living in a yeah. world in which these things are hard to find. So, yeah, I think it's – that's one of those things where – now, and like you say, if it's if it's a, you know, Crunchyroll exclusive Gunpla, you have my attention, right? But beyond that, it's hard to say. Um so. Yeah, I, I doubt it's going to be um, crunchy roll, crunchy he make car thermal car wrap mm. for your car. Mm-hmm. If you're a premium member, instead of paying five thousand dollars for it, it's only going to be twenty five hundred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it's mm. yeah. the the world of exclusive things that they're probably likely to drop coin on mm-hmm. to make the average otaku sit up and be like, oh yeah, I really yeah, I'm all on that. Mm-hmm. They're not going to drop that much coin for that. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Well, um, legal anime streaming continues to expand, and illegal consumption appears to continue to decline. Uh, this week brings the end of an era in anime and manga piracy, at least. Kiss Anime and Kiss Manga have officially shut down. Kiss Anime and Kiss Manga linked to and embedded many, many, many pirated anime and manga series, seeing approximately 95 million visitors 
in the last six months before the close. Now in access, the site simply states, all files are taken down by copyright owners. The site will be closed forever. Thank you for your supports. A post was also made in the KISS Community Discord server, which claims to be run by community staff members and not site administrators, stating the sites are gone for good, data deleted, and cannot be recovered. It can be guessed that these closures have to do with the expanded Japanese copyright law, which went into effect in June. The law has been expanded to punish those who knowingly download manga and other materials that were pirated, pirated or illegally uploaded, and to ban leech sites that aggregate and provide hyperlinks to pirated media. So it's a pirating, you know, uh, specific uh, 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 law change there. After the site shut down, uh, Anime News Network released a survey to gauge fans' reaction to the news. It found that 56% of responders had never even used Kiss Manga, but the 76% had used Kiss Anime to some degree. 29% of responders uh, replied that they had used the site in the past, but only for anime not legally available. And 23% responded that they used it to watch anime not available to them for free, which kind of makes sense. When asked about the use of other manga and anime piracy sites, the survey again showed that the majority of responders did use other piracy, piracy sites, but only in cases where the media of choice was not avail legally, available legally or for free. So we learned a lot from that question. But... Uh -huh. um, point being that that is now a um, uh, a change in that uh, those sites are are gone. I, it, it's funny. I'm one of these people where, in terms of piracy sites, I don't keep track. Like I don't have a you know I I, I don't remember. Oh yes, I watched this thing on this site back in you know 2015. I probably mm. used Kiss Anime at some point in the past. Um, I probably you know read a chapter or two of a manga on kiss manga at some point um but it's piracy is such this behemoth with so many tentacles everywhere it kind of feels like oh yeah piracy site number 3128 went down you know I yeah know. there will always be more mm -hmm. well and, and you know that's anytime that you look through um the my anime list listing of mm. new anime that's coming out and I don't, I don't follow it on for the manga but yeah at least for the new anime that there are some that you know the little recommendation bar that'll you know things that'll pop up that i'll go to and it's right in the strike zone of the little slice of life fun looks like it's going to be a good show and there's yeah. no listed licensors mm -hmm. right yep. and it's like you know i don't know which ones but same sort of thing it's like i've been through this to find movies that I cannot find mm -hmm. series that I cannot they're not licensed anywhere and it's like I have no idea how how are you supposed to get a hold of these well you're not you know what I mean <laughs> well you're, you're, you're not, not. Supposed to, right <laughs> yeah you're not yeah. that's the easy <laughs> answer but uh being a resourceful otaku you know mm -hmm. you end up looking you look mm -hmm. for those things and it's just like it's just it's interesting I would hope that cracking down on pirate sites with you know the mm -hmm. demise of, of kiss anime that we're going to see a little you know uptick in the mm -hmm. other side of this where it's yeah. like the licensing is going to get better and faster mm -hmm. because what? that is the other part of this piracy issue it's like if and, you can keep up with the demand you don't end up with piracy and in fairness that's what we have seen over the long term Right? Yeah, like, it's we, getting better. You know, we all remember when it would take three years to get a series, you know, over here. Yeah. yeah. Um, and now it's taking, you know, basically zero time at all. But it's, you know, we don't, we don't get everything. So that that is the, the tension. There was an interesting yeah. article, um, academic article I read at some point, uh, from somebody who knew some of the folks in the publishing industry, and they contend, I am not claiming proof or anything like that. They are just claiming that the anime industry and the manga industry absolutely knew that anime and manga had potential in the U in the US and in North America and the rest of the world and um, deliberately turned a, a blind eye to piracy because they knew the processes of getting it licensed and getting it over here were still so uh, still took so long. Okay, they were like, yeah. we are happy for that to exist because it is letting people at least access it and see it. And because this is still like the 90s, you know, or whatever, um, it's hard mm. to get. So you'll find it at a convention. Someone will hand you a tape. But it's not like everybody it has a giant library 
of you know every pirated anime ever. Right. Um, Actually, there there is that one otaku. Right. <laughs> Who has in this in his vault? Mm. In his vault, it's all there. Yes, and every night he goes through and goes, "We shall release this." <laughs> That's how it works. The, it's and the old, boy. it's the old Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> right. Where did, the, where, where do you keep this anime? How, how is it being stored? It's being looked That's at right. by, no, top pretty, pretty. by top men. By top men. Oh, okay. oh okay. okay, sure. Meanwhile, we, we you see a um, part of, of manga being yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the original Akira. But it's again, apparently they're basically like it's going to happen. Like like we're going to get to a point where we can make money off of this, you know, off of this market. But we can't now. And if we get aggressive on piracy. You know, today in 1989 or whenever, it's just never going to happen. Um, so it is better for us to just not really pay attention to it and let it be out there as a way of, of getting getting people uh, going. Growing, growing things. You've seeded the the field and now it grows. And I think you well, see that now even with these laws, where you know, the laws are not are not going after every pirate every piracy site ever. Like right. when they, they went out after, they went after like the three big ones. And that was it. So, hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, you know, when I was, you know, finally, you know, giving my age away here, finally on the internet mm. and being able to get things on a dial up. <laughs> In your oh, yeah. 14.4K dial up. Yeah. With my Pentium 4 oh, my, my yeah. Pentium 486, mm. you know. Uh, <laughs> Pentium, weren't you fancy? Oh, oh yeah, should be on a should have um, been on a three eighty six SX, <laughs> <laughs> with two fifty six K, baby. There you go. Um, <laughs> anyway, but but you know, you, I, I think there's a lot of people actually um, don't even realize that they're going onto a piracy site. Yeah, because I yeah. I was yeah. at you know I'm, I'm just kind of like finally you know when I, once I got a phone that you know an Android or whatever and I was like going oh hey I can look up manga. And I was looking at Manga Fox, and then yeah. I was just like, "Why? Why does my phone keep crashing? I don't understand." Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you figure, yeah. it out, of course. But um, y'all ever heard of GoGo Anime? Oh, yeah. Oh boy, talk about a whack a mole for freaking uh, viruses and all kinds of horror. Oh yeah. boy, you couldn't even go look at an image that was the website itself without <laughs> getting like all kinds of malicious attack alerts. Be like, mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> oh well. <laughs> I, yeah, you hit. You used to hit like one screen, and like six would just. Bup, 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 yeah. Bup, bup. It, it's like, oh it's yeah, okay. this is this is this is the uh, this is the not this is the bad part of the Ishizoku <laughs> reviewers of piracy, <laughs> where nobody has fun and everybody comes away with something. And, and that's actually a good point too. Is that these tend to be going after the sites that are, you know, very ad heavy, very you know, they are making money off of it. As opposed yeah, to right. the average, you know, here's something for free. We're just kind of letting it out there. So it's clearly not fan activity, right? You know, right. some of these sites. Right. Well, the thing that's, that's, I, and I, I, as an absolute statement, piracy is wrong. The, the proceeds need to go to the appropriate parties. Fill in legal disclaimers here. <laughs> A lot of 80s and 90s and early 2000s stuff is just not it does it has, doesn't have enough traction to be in current streaming services mm -hmm. where you can pay for it mm -hmm. there's a lot of backlog that's out there that it's it's really interesting it's like you know if you're trying to stop piracy absolutely you know geez you're cutting off all this this stuff that really probably doesn't have a very good profit stream anymore it's been yeah. it's been out of print by 10 years it's been off television for you know 15 20 years i wonder if there is a sort of litmus test to being like okay you know here's the profitability bar it's been within this much time and we still have an active franchise that you know vested interest and here we go here's this stuff and we've already squeezed everything out of it we can. So we're just – we don't care. You know, if you're – not retro crush, but I think that was one, Steve, you had mentioned last yeah. week. It's like something like that where it's like nothing modern, nothing current. Mm -hmm. It's old enough that the profitability stream is gone. 
we're not after that. Mm -hmm. We're after somebody who's making right. money off of current stuff that we should be receiving our rightful money for. Mm -hmm. This this is where um, I make the case for public domain for anime, which you don't really see a lot of. And and what that is is just a, basically allowing the license to drop, mm. allowing the copyright to drop, and then it becomes public domain, and then you can do whatever you want to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are plenty of movies um, talking talking about old. You know, silent movies like Nosferatu is mm. public domain. You can do right. that. You can you can take that and show it to a crowd and mm -hmm. not have to worry about anything. Well, hell, so, Metropolis by this point right, in time has got to be yeah. public domain. The problem is 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 where and this is where I don't know mm. the answer to this question is what is where in Japan mm. does the the does the public domain where, where where does something become public domain? Is there public domain? Mm. Or is it fair use, which is something completely different and very tricky? Mm -hmm. And, you know, as opposed to America, because the copyright law is supposed to take an effect to whatever country it exists in. Mm -hmm. So if the anime is, you know, obviously made in Japan, you go by their laws. So I don't know the law. So I, I don't know if, if public domain exists. I, I'm, I'm fairly certain it does. But when is there can be a catalog like here in America where we actually do have a process says okay here's a piece of work nobody's done anything to claim the copyright the license anything they're just letting it go All right so we can declassify this as public domain it's co actually codified as public domain so that americans can look at this and go ah public domain i can do whatever i want with this and that's a brent you and i were talking about something that was playing around with writing stories on an old DC character that's defunct mm. as public domain called the Red Bee. Mm. So, you know, if no one picks up the license, then you can do whatever you want with it. Mm -hmm. But it has to be in public domain. So is there a process in Japan for that to happen so that these these like like it, you're absolutely right. There's there's anime out there where you just look at it and you just go, There's no way this is gonna turn a profit right. for anything mm -hmm. for anybody. So why I mean, don't we why don't we just mean ultimately accessible to everybody. you might have that question of at least for manga and anime given the you know nearness and time you might have successors and assigns mm -hmm. which would be more of the problem so mm -hmm. like you know tezuka's well great nephew and you know what i mean yeah. might be around to be like hey, I'm, I'm a successor and assigned to tezuka's uh the, the estate, estate rights yeah. well, and other and the, the big problem is that these aren't owned by a single pe person right the anime is right. owned by the production committee so you have six people right. who all have to agree to drop the copyright, uh, which which complicates it. I didn't think about that. Just start. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I I I I sympathize with that. I think there's a lot of weird, obscure stuff that I wish just got you know released out and and made available. Uh, but I think it does make it harder, right? Um, yeah. Uh, it's tough. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, it's one of those really complicated things where I, I think you uh, you know. Um, ownership, you know, and 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 potential sales, right, are are often kind of what you argue there, but that's all pie in the sky, right? Like, who can really say how popular something might be in the future? I, I mm. right. You know, well, I, do you says, think? Do you think? Gotta hold on to it forever. It's like, but how do you know yeah. you're gonna make any money off of it? <laughs> well, space right. runaway idiom. Mm. You know what I mean? It's, well, it is a thing of its time, mm -hmm. but is that going to be popular well, enough to like generate money in twenty oh, years? I mean, Idion is still, you know, it, it's still a classic. I mean, I, I think Idion is one of those. Oh, I'm, I'm not disputing on, yeah. classic, but I'm just saying, you know, something that that in its day and age is that still going to be profitable twenty years from now? There's got to be stuff twenty years ago that you know isn't. <laughs> it's just, it's <laughs> just there mm -hmm. if it survives in any kind of format. Yeah, yeah. VHS cassettes out there somewhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, you, we had the problem now with lost media. Uh, there's a service I uh, supported for a while that, that uh, tracked down the rights to out-of-print science fiction novels to reprint, to, to reprint them and make them available and do like digital releases and so forth uh, that were oh, you know, wow. from, like 1923 and the rights had just gone into a hole for 50 years. Um, and so they, they would go and track it down and find it out and find out how they could re-release this thing and make it sort of, you know, generally available. 
and under a was it was it was it Gutenberg? Was it Gutenberg? No, no, no. no. This, is, this is not. Yeah, okay, separate from that. Uh, okay, so that's uh, okay. Um, he, he made a Bible. <laughs> so I understand. Uh, yeah, no. yeah, th th this was simply going after things that did have copyright. Um, and, oh, and, okay. But that had so they got right. Okay. Right. So the copyrights existed, but they were, you know, they were owned by somebody who had been dead for twenty years. So it's like, well, who actually owns right. this now, and what's the da, 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 da. Uh, and that's mm. a big complicated thing. Um, so it's really hard. Uh, and yeah, and then folks in the chat room are also pointing out, yeah, and then the that 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 anime is as an adaptation of a, of a manga, which they might then redo a thing on. And, oh gosh, they might so. do a light novel on, or a, or a or a, a game. Uh. So let's move into the much simpler world of five hundred one c three nonprofits. Um, <laughs> As of last week, the Society for the Promotion of Japanese Animation, the organization behind Anime Expo, Anime Project, and World Cosplay Summit USA, has announced their new classification as a 501c3 charitable and educational organization. It was previously classifi classified as a 501c6 trade association, but believes that the new C3 status better aligns with their current structure, activities, and mission. Uh, SBJA said as a nonprofit, it is dedicated to educating the public about Japanese animation and pop culture. Though both C3 and C6 organizations are exempt from federal income taxes, C3 organizations can receive tax-deductible charitable contributions, while payments to a C6 organization are only deductible if they serve an ordinary and necessary business expense. The SBJA president and CEO, Ray Chang, made a statement about the transition, saying he believes the new status, quote, will allow us to aid our work and achieve our goal of increasing appreciation and understanding of Japanese animation and pop culture. As we move into our 30th year, we want our organization at all levels, yeah, to reflect our passion and commitment to promoting awareness of and appreciation for Japanese culture, end quote. In other words, he explained absolutely nothing at all. But um, I think this is kind of interesting to talk a, bit, a, a little bit about because it sounds like they're looking for some charitable donations. Yep. yep. Um, this is of course the part of the quote you missed mm. was at the very end where he said, "And this is not about world domination." I can't make that clear enough. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a that was no. a tell, okay. wasn't it? <laughs> no. Um, this is actually what I used to do for a living. Um, was working five hundred one three Cs and Ryan, work on world domination. And that too. Um, huh. for, for okay. um for education so basically what what they're doing here is that they are tapping into the well of uh of foundation giving and it's what what otakor does with otakon um if you ever guys if, for those of you if we ever go back to otakon it becomes you know we can go back to the actual physical convention they do every year a panel on they talk about how they do their finances it's a very interesting panel a welcome questions go see it. it it'll give you a very good idea of how they spend the money um a 5013 c enables an organization to tap into multiple education grants that can be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars mm. it also enables them to go after grants that are called operational grants operational grants basically are the ones that keep the lights on they pay for the accountants they pay for the right. space and you know things like that so you, you it enables them to garner much more money or things that they have to do for the for that, those things, which is not easy. Um, they're gonna have to they're gonna have to do a lot of tracking. They're gonna have to do a lot of, you know, they, they have to justify. They have to prove to the grant to the grants uh, that yes, these are the amount of people that we're serving. This is what we did. This is what we're the, the things that we're doing. But if you but it's it's good for them to to do that if the mission is actually indeed to spread anime awareness mm -hmm. and education and, and and it's cultural education and the best part of it for them and other it's a large organization large organizations that go that route like otakon uh, the benefit for them is that japan uses this as a cultural trade issue and they right. bring it up it's it's not it's not like you know it's not like a you know Japanese American relations will crash if we don't have this anime convention. Mm -hmm. But it's something that they say that, you know, when you do a grant and you say you're applying for a $250,000 grant from mm -hmm. um, the federal government to promote 
education awareness on cultural of Japan. And you can list that you work with the consulate in DC to do these mm. things and they provide you things to do this. You know, that's huge. Mm. And that, you know, people look at that and they go, Oh wow. You know, this costs money, but look at what they're bringing in. Look what Otakon brought in on their first year at the Washington center. They brought in a Buddhist, a Shinto Buddhist temple. Mm. They brought in monks. They brought in a lot of culture and a lot of history. And they st started talking about that kind of stuff now. So this is a, it, it, Let's call it what it is. It's they're doing it for the money. Sure, right? yeah. the money is, is, is going to is going to finance a lot of their stuff, and it does one other thing. It enables them to survive between now and the end of when we finally uh, all get out of out of our homes and are able to go to yeah. a convention. This allows them to do programs in lieu of a convention, so they'll be able to go. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, our convention is doing this right now. We're airing this right now. We've we're doing this with the consulate. The consulate is is going to zoom in on a meeting with us and blah 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 blah. And so it keeps you in there and you have money and you have operational money to keep you alive until mm -hmm. you get to that point where you can go in again. Mm -hmm. That's why when Otakon finally decided to to cancel, one of the things I said in my video was let them keep the money 2021. Don't ask for your refund because they that money will just go into 2021's budget. Mm -hmm. Right now, the now the 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 thing of it is is that, and I don't know the governing board of this organization at all, so this is me merely speculating. But you're going to have to reorganize your board, your oversight committees, your oversight organization, things like that. So this is going to become more board intensive it, it, and they can't be like what Otakon does which is a you know, from year to year to year they have their 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 executive director and and people that work under them former members were there are now their board members mm. but they're not going to be able to do that as uh. much they're, they're going to have to bring in other people to to actually oversight mm -hmm. the the convention so there's a whole new level of governance that's going to be added to this. Mm -hmm. And it might change how they do things, how they operate things. Sure. Um, but it could be, but honestly, as you can tell my voice, it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. it, it's a lot of changes. They're going to undergo a lot of changes, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. And it's a survival tactic. So mm -hmm. so I, I wish them well on this. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Um, whatever it takes, right? Yeah. Totally. Uh, all right, moving right along, um, a uh, positive story this week as well. Last year, um, producer Yoshitada Fukuhara of 8 million tweeted about the average budget anime studios are given to produce their episodes. As of this week, he's posted an update and it shows quite an increase in allocated funds, at least for certain companies. As of last year, Fukuhara estimated that anime studios are given an average of around 15 million yen to produce each episode, or around 142,000 US dollars. Again, that's per episode for an anime series. Um, his tweet this week noted that as of recently, some studios are receiving up to 5 million yen more per episode, pushing the budgets closer to 20 million, or about $190,000 an episode. In addition, some studios are even able to get royalties on the series they create if they're successful. The studios getting royalties are, of course, usually the larger ones who create the season's most popular anime. Part of the reason some production committees are increasing studios' budgets is to help attract more talented creators, Natch, as overseas distributors are focused on the popularity of the original work, the studio, and the creator when they license the series at a high price, so a majority of the orders are concentrated on the more popular studios. In other words, the, um, uh, you know, the names involved are now more important when licensing it overseas. Fukuhara noted, however, that the changes are adding difficulties for some smaller studios. Quote, on the contrary, it is difficult for smaller studios to claim royalties. Overall budgets are increasing, but the royalties made through domestic broadcast TV licensing are changing and gradually disappearing. The new idea is that once an original work has a proven track record, then the studio will be able to claim royalties, end quote. Finally, he gave his prediction for the future. Quote, the trend in the future will be for production studios to not only produce works, 
but also to create a system that allows them to do their own copyright business, to merge or be acquired by a major company, or to work with a production company. The number of original works is decreasing, and it would be nice if there were more original anime created by studios. So it sounds like, um, you know, as with everything, there are good, you know, positive and negative aspects to this story. But it does sound like, you know, um, budgets are increasing. Money is coming to anime studios more. And again, this is the budget that the studio receives for the episode. Uh, those are generally increasing. Note this is somebody who is looking at major studios primarily. Um, right. And uh, I am shocked to hear and very pleased to hear that studios are now able to get, actually get royalties on the stuff that they make, even when apparently it's not like an original thing that they're making for themselves. That's pretty darn cool. Yeah, that's, I mean, it would be nice to see some of these content creators actually get a living wage. Mm -hmm. Some of the horror stories I hear about these poor guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, it's it's going to be interesting. And now, I should also point out, just for fairness, um, increasing budgets does not necessarily mean increased salaries. Right. right. That is not a one-to-one -one translation, oh. so we're, we're not saying that's actually happening. But it is a trend in the right direction, which can then trickle down eventually. Um, and it is also good that they're looking uh, yeah. for... Trickle down theory. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, but it is also good um, to that point that, that he points out that name recognition is more important now. Um, so they need to bring in those big names. They need to bring in those, those significant people, which means if you can make a name for yourself, you know, you can sort of rise up. Right. That is now more significant than it used to be, which is, I think, a good thing. I think also in general, because it, it indicates that overseas fans are getting more educated about the staff behind anime. Right. Yeah. Well, for the increase per episode, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's good that it's going up. But what, is that, what, what does that number mean? You know, what would one episode of Attack on Titan mm -hmm. cost to make? Would it be 142, 152,000? Or would it be like 200,000 because the studio has the money for that? You know what I mean? So, what, is, what, is that, what does that number mean? I, I think it, yeah, it's an average. Um, from what I've seen number wise, it's generally so a, a bigger budgeted series would be more like, say, and trying to calculate this in. Um, back in the day would be more like the, the variance was about 60 to 70 thousand dollars plus or minus sort of the the, the maximum or the okay. you know, um, on, on, on either side so you could you know you could shave it down by 30 or 40 you know increase it by 30 or 40 uh, and then you get the occasional outliers like ghost in the shell standalone complex um stuff like that they just got you know yeah way much bigger budgets than the average show. Yeah. Um, so, and I think what this is doing, from judging from the anime I've seen recently, what that, that is definitely seems to be going towards, um, at least partly, is more drawings, like, like more actual movement in the show. Uh, you know, there's no question that there's a lot more movement going on in the average episode of, you know, a Moe series today than there was 15 years ago. Yeah, and I, you know, it's 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 interesting the royalties thing. That mm -hmm. why hasn't that come up before now? You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like why? So this this is this royalties thing just a new concept, or are they just sort of getting better at codifying it? And that before it was sort of hit or miss. No, I, I think in the past studios did not get royalties for the anime they made. That was that was one of the whole problems. Is that if if you made an anime series, you're a you you are making that on spec. You are like a you're like a, a, a print shop. You know, you are getting paid yeah. to produce these things. And when we walk away, we, we walk away. You got paid for that job. Uh, you didn't get, you know, you're not getting royalties off of that. Unless you make an original work when you own it. And so obviously you own the, yeah, the royalties because it's right. your, your original work. Um, so it sounds like if you're the studio behind, you know, the next attack on Titan, you have the chance to make royalties off of that because it's so big. Interesting. Mm-hmm. That's why that, that leads to the question of, like, did the old classic studio system, so like Warner Brothers Studios, Universal, MGM, did they get, you know, was it, MGM made uh, Gone with the Wind? Sounds and, right. uh, Wizard, Wizard of, and Wizard of Oz. Mm. I think so. Did they get royalties off of that? 
Who? They they weren't their stories, MGM, because oh. oh. they made the film. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm sure. You know what I mean? Or you know what I mean? It's yeah. like so. That's just there really is... interesting to think that what this is why you... studio system. Yeah. This is why you have an uh, and not jo- uh, all joking aside. This is when you have a a good lawyer yeah. and a good uh, yeah. on your side to do these things with the movie studios because if you don't. And I think what this is what Brett you're alluding to is what happening with the animation studios in Japan, is that there is no there is not that uh, that doesn't exist, and there's nobody to represent you to say this is his work, this is what he's doing, and this is the royalties they guess off of it if it's his own independent work. But if you're talking about people who are working, you know, as as a group on a, on someone else's idea, you don't get it. Your 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 job is is specifically this, but if you are like, for example, when you write a story to a magazine and the magazine buys buys a story, they buy it on a certain level of rights and you, that you agree to printing rights, like first North American rights or something like that. And men, most of the time, when you when you sell a story, they basically say, "Here's your one hundred and twenty dollars. Thank you so much. We have the rights for this for the first publication, and then the rights reverts back to you. Mm-hmm. Then you do whatever you want." I don't think that exists. Uh, am I right so, on that, Brent? I, I don't know. A, I'm not a copyright lawyer. B, from what I understand, <laughs> um, um, th- there are contractual things that go into all this stuff. You know, if, if right. a production company forms to make Attack on Titan, for example, um, there will be legal paperwork that is signed to say, yes, we're all a production committee, we're doing this, you're doing this, so forth and so on. The thing is, for the longest time, you know, the standard structure of that was, um, you know, the anime studio gets paid to do X, period. Moving on, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there was never any expectation that the anime studio would make, would make money off of it because they are just producing this thing then goes and then funnels back in. Um, now, I haven't... Been, apparently, Evan Gellion was one of the series that significantly changed the production committee formula, but I haven't been able to find out what exactly it did. Um, Ah. I suspect, because Gynax, that they did negotiate something to say, even though, you know, know, this is our thing, so we get to make all the money off of it. Uh, Because, my gosh, that saved their studio. Um, Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, and this has not been an expectation, I think, for, for a very long time, that the studio actually makes, uh, uh, makes money uh, beyond the production phase. Well, this will be very interesting. I mean, if it is certainly related to, to big-name studios, hopefully it will, you know, similar idea, trickle down so that you can have some of these, you know, newer studios getting into the, into the biz having a little bit more of a cash flow mm-hmm. in general that, you know, they can sink back into the quality of the business and that you won't just see super studios doing awesome and then everybody else starving to death well you know and it also leads to the fact that and this is one of the exactly that point um one of the problems studios have had for a long time is because they are entirely contractual they have to be constantly finding the next thing the next thing the next thing yeah in you know in, in exact lockstep so they don't have you know a day when no one's doing anything and I think if they, I think one of the reasons they can do this is they can pitch it to say, hey, if you want us to be around in two years to make your next thing, we need some continuity of cash. <laughs> so yeah. if we can find <laughs> some way to make this just a little less bumpy for us, then we can have a much more consistent working relationship into the future. Ideally. Yeah, we don't do this, you know, in the off season when we're not tuna fishing. <laughs> right. And we have right. some money. <laughs> totally. Um, so, yeah, so good news in general. Hope that that moves on. Um, other good news. Uh, Gundam isn't the only classic Super Robot series with an anniversary this year. This year also marks the 30th anniversary of Sunrise's Brave series. The Brave, or Yusha, series began as a deal between Sunriser and toy maker Takara after the end of the original Generation 1 storyline of Transformers. That's right. Fan interest in the series had begun to decline, so the two companies struck up a deal to create a new franchise and toy line and create a total of eight original shows in the series from 1990 to 1997, beginning with uh, X Kaiser and ending with Gao Gaigar. Ultimately, the plan worked as the franchise not only sparked more interest in Transformers, but in the super robot genre in general. To celebrate the anniversary, a Brave series exhibit is coming to Shibuya in December and January. 
The exhibit will showcase the history of the eight anime over two separate periods to make sure all the series get their proper representation. There will also be uh, displays and materials from related peripheral series like Saint of Brave's Burn Garn, which was originally intended to be the eighth Brave series, but instead became a video game original. And, of course, like any good exhibit, there will also be a shop featuring limited edition goods. Gotta have that. In, yep. In addition to the physical event, the Hakaba no Garu YouTube channel will be hosting a special live stream September 6th, which will reminisce over the history of the series and offer news and sneak peeks related to the upcoming exhibit. So, just in general, you know, a, uh, a feel-good story, I think, for the week. Have you guys seen any of the, the Yusha series? No, I, I, I don't I, think I have, I unfortunately. Think I, I don't think I know anyone who has. There's probably one or two folks in the chat room. Uh, I'm sure AC has it at some point. AS has it at some point. Um, the, uh, they're, they're fun. I've seen like an episode or two here and there. They're fun. They're, they're very much a light super robot series. Um, apparently, from what I've heard... Ah, Jay's seen it. Awesome. Um, from what I've heard... So, mm, apparently... Uh, there were a bunch of unused character designs or mecha designs from the Transformers series. Because uh, they just, you know, churned out a bunch of things and some of them hadn't gotten used. And so they said, hey, we have spare character des spare designs for, for robots. Let's make a show out of this. You know? And so they, they worked together, Sunrise and, uh, and, uh, and Takara, to, 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 to move forward with that, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, but the character design for the Yugo Transformer really <laughs> wasn't really. Nobody really wanted that. Well, that the, yeah, the Pinto one was really not very successful. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. The rear end exploding collision as a fight scene is not nearly as exciting as it sounds. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what time is it? It's past ten. That comment really was good for past ten. <laughs> oh my. Oh. Uh, well, yeah. anyway, <laughs> anyway, um, oh, oh. Oh. Uh, moving along to an, uh, actually a serious story um, uh, worth pointing out. Uh, another exhibit has been opened honoring the artwork of a late Kyoto animation artist. This one dedicated to art director and background artist Mikiko Watanabe. The exhibit was taking place inside the Kuwana Machi no Eki souvenir store in Kuwana City, Mie Prefecture, using image files provided from Watanabe's computer by KyoAni. The 35-year-old artist served as an art director and background artist on various QA series, including Violet Evergarden, Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, and Myriad Colors Phantom World. She was even posthumously given an award for her work from the Tokyo Anime Film Festival in February in the background color video category. The exhibit was set up by her great aunt, herself a paper cutting artist, who said that she wanted to leave proof that Watanabe lived. She decided to hold the exhibit after seeing her great niece's work displayed at the funeral, saying, quote, it might be called background art, but the drawings are all so wonderful and have such loving attention to detail, I want all kinds of people to see it, end quote. Uh, apparently this exhibit has been going on for quite a while already, um, and this has garnered a lot of attention to it and made a lot of folks uh, stop by and check it out. Uh, definitely, you know, um, background artists and background art in general, I think, are undervalued by a lot of anime fans, uh, and because they are... They are definitely central to the experience. I was gonna say you, it's really boring to have blank yep. behind things, yeah. or or you know, again, it's not picking on Scooby Doo, but the repeating mm. scene that just sort of scrolls by while they're running or something is you know. Or staying door, bored. <laughs> bookcase, <laughs> <Staying> mirror, <laughs> door. door, bookcase, <laughs> mirror. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. There is something to be said for you know the the background art and things like that, and just mentioning back to Metropolis, you you can see how important that is with the background. Well, background it, art. it's the only means of really immersing you in the entirety yeah. of the story. I mean, you know, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it, um, you know, you talk about Astro Boy in your mm. in your panel sometimes. And sometimes the panel is, it, or sometimes the, the cell is just Astro Boy and the giant robot and gray. lips gray, yeah. yeah, and the lips and that's it. Mm -hmm. And you know, product for its time. But nowadays, you know, we need that that beautiful backgrounds and and things like that. And the thing that is that bothers me whenever I read about these deaths is the age of these people. Mm -hmm. And you know, this this one died at the age yeah. of thirty five, and you have to look at. It seems like it's been happening for the past 
what six years now people are just you know it seems like every month somebody somebody's dying mm -hmm. and i'm just you know like part of me was just like wishes i was a billionaire so i could set up the anime industry medical fund mm -hmm. you know to make sure that these people whatever it is you know that's causing them to be sickly or i i just don't understand why this is well this this is thing. because of the kill yeah. fire Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't didn't realize the yeah. connection there. Yeah. But still, I mean, uh, outside of that, mm. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, mm. much of this talent is going away. Mm. I mean, it could be around for the next you know, 25, 30 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and especially Kyoto Animation. Um, I remember uh, yeah. watching a thing on Haruhi Suzumiya and how I, they went back after the first season came out and noticed things like there was an exterior shot of the school with a window open and they noticed that that window open would have been the window open on the club room because that's where they had decided the club room was in the building but it wasn't open in the interior shot they did so they went back and repainted that background to fix it because it was a continuity error even though how I, on earth would anyone notice that that you know <laughs> that was that wow window. so you know they did and that's and that's cool mm -hmm. so yeah caring about which i mean people. minor con yeah minor continuity errors yeah you know i mean it's sort of like the uh, the printout if you can read this then you are a genius thing where it's the letters are all uh, gobbledygook mm -hmm. And then you can still, you know, the way that your mind works, you're not reading the whole le word anyway. You're only reading parts of it. Mm -hmm. It's like you miss, I'm sure there's a ton of continuity errors in a lot of anime. And oh, it's just, yeah. it's not, you know, it's not something that necessarily rises to that level. For So for somebody to notice a window open and to go back and fix it, it's like, <laughs> wow. No. That's a, more anal retentive than the people watching exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah, there's, there's a great yeah. moment in one of the documentaries from one of the Star Wars prequels where... Um, they're filming a scene with, I think, Anakin and Padme, um, and they're they're walking um, on a patio, and somebody had just like sprayed water down to like water the plants or something, and so the patio was wet, and somebody went over to to George Lucas and said that patio's wet, and we haven't seen it before or anything, and in this shot, so that's okay, but aren't audiences gonna like ask why the patio is wet? And he said. If the audiences are paying attention to the water on the ground, we're not doing our jobs very well. <laughs> um, and, you know, and he was right. Like, that wasn't the focus of the scene. Like, the, the audience can fill that in. Like, right, those details don't matter. It's the, those continuity things that the folks get, you know, you know care about. Uh, because we're, we're used to seeing wet ground, right? Like, wet ground is just a thing. Right. Um, but, yeah, no, totally. Um, moving on to a uh, also a somewhat heavy story, but one of the things is interesting to talk about. Um, if I can get my thing to transition, there we go. To mark the 75th anniversary of VJ Day on August 15th, Gundam's franchise creator Yoshiki Tomino and original character designer Yoshikazu Yasuhiko held an interview to discuss the themes of war in anime. Tomino said that he regards the casual use of warships and tanks in entertainment as a sign that conflict isn't treated seriously. By the younger generation. He commented, quote, In the anime world, stories like Girls and Ponzer and Khan Kohli have come out. There are parts that I can accept as entertainment, but I wonder if this is okay. For my generation, it's thought war shouldn't be represented this way, and it makes me uncomfortable. End quote. As an example of an anime he thinks handles the subject matter well, he offered Tsunao Karabuchi's In This Corner of the World film, which he considers rare for portraying conflict through the eyes of the Japanese citizens and showing how the military closed in on civilian life. Tomino objects to the public's perception of the military as cool, saying, quote, There's nothing cool about it. After all, war must not happen. However, unfortunately, we'll never be uh, rid of war thanks to the, to the delusions of those who yearn for it, end quote. He also noted that there will be no war in his next project, and while Space Battleship Yamato 2205 will still come out, he doesn't know what that will look like. He went on to say that he doesn't expect Japan to see another war as it is instead flooded with environmental issues to tackle. Yasuhiko also gave his thoughts on the way humanity views past wars. Referencing how history tends to repeat itself, he says, quote, We are basically stupid, yet what keeps our sanity in the midst of it all is not religion, justice, patriotism, or anything like that. 
I think they were drawn to the perspective of the little people who are caught up in the conflict, and we see ourselves in them. When humanity is unable to see the effects they have on the little people, they tend to commit terrible mistakes, end quote. He reflected that some of the reason people tell stories about war is to witness the difficult times others lived through, but that even small age gaps can create vast differences in life experience. He commented, quote, We, who were educated in democracy after the war, did not respect our elders. We berated them, saying, Those were the guys who made the mistakes. Why did they participate in such an idiotic war? The people who suffered in the war spoke little of their suffering, and because we received no retaliation, we were free to run our mouths but we were merely ignorant of their suffering. That's why I feel like we have to make amends to tell them that they too went through terrible things, end quote. So some strong words there, I think, from some folks who have definitely spoken about war quite a lot in the past. Uh, as you were, as you were uh, talking about it, I was thinking about Shigeru Mizuki mm -hmm. and, and his experiences in in uh world war Two, and the fact that he didn't even want to to be there you know that, that it just didn't make sense to him to begin with and he had the fear of death he went through the war lost his drawing arm came out of it on the other side had an entire career in front of him but you know he had that moment of time where he came back where it, you know he saw the futility of it mm -hmm. you know he watched his friends die he watched everyone die around him and you know, he came back home and he saw the, what the war had done back home. And, you know, and it, this, you know, I was thinking about that as you were reading off these quotes. And I'm just like, these, this is a generation that even if they didn't fight in World War II, they were the direct result of that mm -hmm. conflict. Even if they were only a year old when the war ended, you know, that's something that they lived with as a generation for a long time. Mm -hmm. And there is, you know, I, I kind of look at, at other things and, you know, like, you know, it, it, the, the saying that, you know, we don't have a, a, a good view of what war is being frivolous mm -hmm. is kind of true to me. Mm -hmm. uh, when I particularly think about American involvement in Afghanistan and I, in Iraq, you know, I have family members who, who fought in that war, but... I think terrible happened to us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, as, 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 as individuals, you know, there was no, you know, the, 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 the anime they referenced to that I've yet to watch. Cause I don't know if I can actually go through something emotional mm -hmm. like that again. Um, you know, we didn't, we don't have the fire bombings. We don't have, we don't see these things. Mm -hmm. yep. So it's kind of hard for us to, to not glorify it. So it's, and, but, but at the same time, you know, I watch war movies. I watch, you know, anime that talks like Samurai 7. I talk mm -hmm. about, or, you know, watch, you know, those kinds of things and enjoy those kinds of things and, you know, working my way through Girls and Panzer so I can kind of see what he's getting at. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, it, it's serious. He's right. It's a serious topic. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, I think, I think Tomino's point is good for, for looking at the, the age gap. Yeah that those that came through immediate post-war experience not only saw the difficulties that were brought up by the war, yeah. but they also were front and center stage as America started pushing Japan mm -hmm. to make sure right. that it was a stable, uh, basically a stable base mm -hmm. yeah. so that the U.S. Yeah. could ferry men and supplies into South Korea for the Korean co war conflict mm -hmm. could right. then ferry men and supplies in as a, as a more close regional base for Vietnam and that the continual pressure to build the Japanese self-defense force into a genuinely and legitimately sizable and functional force mm -hmm. in the Western Pacific to hedge against North Korean and Chinese incursions into the Pacific and the Soviet Union and for its time on the Kamchatka Peninsula there. And right. with, you know, trying to make sure that you've got somebody that can stand the test if it has mm -hmm. to come to that. Mm -hmm. And so it, I, I find that very interesting. It's like, that's an older perspective versus the sort of geopolitical perspective that's developed now, where it's even more important to make sure. Mm -hmm. And you see some of these, I, 
not before in years gone by ever seen the Japanese Navy choral presentations of singing Space Battleship Yamato. Mm. You know what I mean? There's a lot of stuff that's much more pro-military. Gate Mm -hmm. is very pro-military. These things are very geopolitically aware of where Japan sits Mm -hmm. now in, in an odd kind of way. During the Cold War, you know what I mean? You still have a lot of World War II rhetoric for you know the futility of war and military is you know overbearing and it you know impinges on the freedom of the people to now where you see more military positive kind of stuff and how that you can still girls and panzer you can still have fun in a tank shooting at somebody else (laughs) you know i mean Mm -hmm. it's like a club even though you're using a giant multi-ton killing machine you can still fall off a bridge. You can, you know, do all kinds of fun stuff and sing and dance, and it's great. So it casts this very yeah. interesting new light into how the military is supposed to be integrated into society, so that people aren't feeling that this violates the Japanese constitution. Right. And you know, as of the right. last few years, there's been more discussion about mm-hmm. altering the Japanese constitution. Sure. And doing things to allow greater military presence and greater military uh, deployment. Well, and I, I, so do you it's, think, it's interesting. Do you, do you think Abe is going to come back? He did in 2007. I, sure. I don't know what his undisclosed health issue is. It, it's, it's inflammation. It's a disease. It's a, a bowel disease. It's an inflammation that, that is quite painful. So irritable bowel syndrome, IBC. Oh, uh, Did Steve just go yeah, quiet? Steve, you, you make a step. Oh. There we go. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, there you go. Good. Okay, cool. Um, it's it's a it's a very painful bowel disease. It causes a lot of pain and it causes um, you know, like hissing like you Crohn's? Um, yeah. Okay. And um, I think it's bowel so, or, or okay. something, something gastrointestinal. Okay. So, it, so it, he, it, you know, there's a chance he could come back, but yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, Cause he's, he kind of spearheaded that, that it, or is, was spearheading that change mm-hmm. you were talking about, mm-hmm. which, and, and I mean, in the, the, to, to borrow the phrase real politic, he's not the one that's by himself suggesting oh, it. No, right. no. You know what I mean? It's he's, like he's, we can we can all be aware of how that works. Mm. So you know, yeah. there's pressure for things to evolve in a way that distributes the risk and the expense. Um, understandably, I mean, you know, if you're going to be a global cop, you want to deputize some people to make sure that you don't foot the entire bill. So right. well, I get that. And and there are a lot, of, a lot of you know folks in Japan who are like you know yeah there are threats over here and we should be able to deal with them independently. You know, I mean, the water cannon contests in the Sea of Japan with Chinese, <laughs> you know, patrol boats is, yep. you know, what I mean, it's like, wow, you yeah. really you're, you guys are doing this because somebody's going to be stupid. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. somebody's going to be on the water cannon and then somebody's going to be like, hey, is this thing loaded? Bang. Mm-hmm. Oh, damn it. Yep. <laughs> that's funny. Stuff's that, going to go really bad. <laughs> and that was and that is the premise of the Tom Clancy book, actually, mm-hmm. where Japan fights back against America to take mm-hmm. back territories. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Um, oh, they're in the military exercise and their their ships are are filled with with weapons and they fire it during a military exercise and start sinking American oh. ships. <laughs> of where it's Clancy. Nice. So, so I'll take it for what it is. One of the things I find so interesting about this is that that generational perspective, um, that idea of people who grew up in the privations of the post-war period, saying, you know, we had to live as kids through having, you know, no money, no food, living off of American, you know, uh, payouts and American food and all that kind of stuff just to survive because of your dumb war, dumb people. You know, how could you have done that? Um, And not recognizing, you know, the complexity of that situation and how many people were involved and, you know, how often things were, um, were not as clear cut <laughs> yeah, as, right. as they felt when they were, you know, 20 years old and, and marching in their, their college. Um, that, uh, that, yeah, uh, that different, each generation has their own perspective on things. And it is interesting, this, this question of living in an era of, of, 
if, you know, fundamental peace might be the best way of putting it, where, you know, th there's not an, you know, an act of war on your doorstep. Um, people have different perspectives on war, right? They, they don't see it as seriously as generations that had to live through it. Um, right. Captain Harlbach. Harlbach is all about that, right? Like, he is, right. he is the one non-decadent human left um, <laughs> in a society that just, you know, shrugs everything off. You know, it's an interesting perspective. And, and I do appreciate the fact that Tomino says, like, I get the entertainment value, right? Like, I understand that these are fluffy, right. light, fun, you know, anime series. But, you know, but, it, point. but again, what's one of those things I always say? If it appears often enough, it's a cultural thing. Yeah. That there's some element to it. So mm -hmm. the yeah. fact that things are light and fluffy mm -hmm. doesn't mean that that's not an undercurrent that is extant exactly. so you can have again you can have fun with tanks mm -hmm. but obviously people are accustomed to tanks yep. you know and i mean they're getting a custom gate you know right. it would be extremely unusual to see someone in downtown tokyo with an automatic rifle mm -hmm. that would sheer <laughs> panic i'm sure would break loose mm -hmm. yeah but visually you've got all these people deployed they're using their their weapons as they're intended to be used. Mm. So, you know what I mean? This is not something that's totally alien to someone mm -hmm. currently. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that you can, you get, you have a grasp on it in a way that obviously has normalized it. Mm -hmm. Well, and what's funny is you look at Tomino's works and this has clearly been a trajectory, right? Like you see Gundam, Zeta Gundam, double Zeta Gundam are definitely, you know, these conflicts. Victory Gundam, it's still this big war and it's being fought by effing children right yeah like that's a 13 year old kid and and the other characters yeah. are clearly underage and it, it brings an immediacy to it turn a gundam there is no war in that spoiler alert you know there are no big battlefield uh, battles in that show it's all guerrilla tactics all guerrilla warfare because i think tomino was saying no i'm not going to give you spectacle i'm not going to give you a giant right. battle um you know i'm not not going to give in to this this I, that that idea um, well, what what the heck is Uchu Senkan Yamato twenty two oh five going to be if there's if you know what I mean if you don't want war to be is like <laughs> is it going to be like next gen where it's like they just shuttle from one place to the next and they bring like diplomats here and then go and ferry some food it, over here it's all drones <laughs> and the drones are shooting at each other and it's fine it, it's it's all fine yeah it's like it's not real war it's yeah. like a video game exactly uh, I think uh, that's so much better. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Contracted to be Amazon delivery. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Amazon. Amazon delivery fighting a new delivery service in space. Ah, oh, cool. We all know that. Plan Planet Express. <laughs> oh, that's a Futurama <laughs> reference. Hey. <laughs> hey. Yeah. We all know. That's it. not yes. anime. Um, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, speaking of which, um, Happy Judgment Day. Happy Judgment Day. Oh, is today? Oh, it's Skynet August, goes live August now? 9th. Yeah. It's the anniversary right. of Judgment Day. Oh, boy. <laughs> so just as a little reminder to everyone that, uh, you know, things can go not the way you expect. But... Hasta la vista. Exactly. Um, there are Lego sets out there based on just about everything except for anime and manga. That might be about to change soon, however. Two fans have pitched their idea for a Naruto-themed Lego set and gotten almost enough supporters to have their design officially reviewed for distribution. The design, posted by Daddy Twins on the Lego Ideas site, is based on the iconic Ichiraku Ramen Shop and has so far collected 9,000 supporters out of the 10,000 required for official review. The set would include the Ramen Shop itself, as well as accessories and mini Lego fi figures of seven of the main Naruto characters. Each figure comes with two faces bearing different expressions and can be equipped with their own personalized ninja accessories. As described by the creators, quote, The set is perfect for display, but also to play with it. You can recreate different scenes of the series with the minifigs and play with the accessories they include. There is no limit for the imagination, and kids would love to revive epic adventures with their favorite heroes. Um, you know, feel-good story of, of uh, to end out our, our week there, I think. Um, I think it would definitely be fun to see more anime and manga characters in Lego because you know eh, why not? I um, it, it, and I saw this uh, on Facebook actually mm -hmm. earlier this week that it had a picture of that. And the first thought that went through my head is I don't watch anything Naruto, but 
I could have a Lego ramen shop. That'd be <laughs> awesome. I want that. Exactly. I, and then I then I sat back and said, "Oh God, I I must be insane." <laughs> like, <laughs> I could have a ramen shop made of Lego from Naruto. That's just, I don't. I, okay, it's that's that's going to be freaky. There we go. <laughs> I and I like know, I, I like the part that you can play with it. It's like no, I would like to see the part where they say you can't play with it. It's very sharp. sharp. <laughs> it's not meant for anything other than to look at it and don't touch it. They're like oh yeah, that that that's going to sell that product good. And I have good <laughs> news. I just refreshed the page. They have they have reached ten thousand supporters. Oh, cool. nice. If only we had Toys R Us to go and see it on the shelf before we bought <laughs> right. it. Yep. Uh, 